everyone. I'm very happy to introduce Helen Forbes. Um, and an interesting aside, both me and Sam have done this for nearly two years now. And yesterday, she worked out how to put the names on the screen. <laughs> well done. <laughs> As a first. <laughs> so can you start off with an introduction to you and your books? Things on the screen. Oh, sorry. What was that, sorry? Let's start off with an introduction to you and your book. Okay, um, as you know, I'm Helen Forbes, a crime writer based in Inverness in the Scottish Highlands, uh, and I've written two police procedurals and two thrillers. Um, the police procedurals in The Shadow of the Hill and Madness Lies are set in Inverness and the Outer Hebrides and feature Detective Sergeant Joe Galbraith. And uh, more recently, last summer, I published Unraveling, which is a psychological thriller set in Inverness and featuring the, nor the former Northern Counties District Lunatic Asylum, uh, a creepy psychi psychiatric hospital. And just a month ago, I published Deception, which is a psychological thriller set in Edinburgh. So that's the um, books that I've published uh, to date. Um, wow. So Deception is one that's just recently come out. Yes, that's right. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about Deception? Okay. Um, Deception set in uh, Edinburgh and it features uh, Lily Anderson, who is a young mother um, of a, a 18 year old, eight, sorry, 18 month old uh, son. And uh, she is, everything on the surface seems to be great. She's living in a beautiful apartment, uh, good looking, successful uh, fiance and um, as the story unfolds, it becomes clear that all is not uh, as wonderful in her life as it might be, and uh, that eventually she, she knows that she has to escape from the relationship she's in. Um, but when she does so, that sets off uh, a whole uh, spiral of um, deception, and she discovers really just how much uh, she didn't know about her fiancé and about the things that he was involved in. So um, there's quite an interesting uh, cast of characters in it. Uh, Lily's estranged from her family, so her friends are uh, a homeless man called Sam who has his own problems. He's being, um, he's being uh, targeted by a rogue cop who's determined to drive him out of the city. And uh, she has another couple of friends who are much older than her, but they're all a fairly interesting cast of characters and people who've read the book already um, seem to quite like the characters and hope that uh, there might be uh, a sequel, which isn't really something I've, I've thought about yet. Um, but yeah, it involves a lot of um, probably fairly um, hard hitting uh, issues. I, I was a social welfare solicitor for several years and uh, I worked with victims and survivors of the type of problems that Lily's had to deal with. And uh, I suppose I want to show just how easy it is for someone, especially someone as young as she is or was when she met Nathan, uh, to get into a difficult situation and struggle to find a way out. Um, so really, that was the sort of basis for it. I lived in Edinburgh for a long time, love the city. Uh, so I was always very keen to set some fiction there. Um, and again, people have said, having read the book, that they've really enjoyed the setting and, uh, you know, felt it was quite atmospheric. I mean, it's a wonderful place. So um, it's, it's really a great place to set fiction. It is. It's a lovely city, isn't it? It is. Um, so what drew you? Because I started off preparing for the author chat by reading In the Shadow of the Hill. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. um, just it was on my bookshelf uh -huh. waiting to read. And that's quite, I don't want to say it's a standard kind of police procedural, but it's more of a, a typical crime. So what's taking uh -huh. you from that to sort of something more like deception? Yes, I, I don't really know what uh, what went on there. I um, never really intended to write crime in the first place and In the Shadow of the Hill came from a short story I wrote, which is now the prologue uh, to In the Shadow of the Hill. Um, and that really, is, it's fairly standard police procedural, although I like to think that, you know, the stories are quite character led rather than plot driven. Um, I, anyway, I, I wrote a sequel to that, Madness Lies, as I said, and uh, the series has kind of stopped there for reasons I probably won't go into too much. Um, um, I, I would love to carry on with it, um, but I haven't yet found a way to do that. Um, and then, you know, over the years, the idea for deception came into my head. And in fact, the character came into my head first of Lily Anderson, and I just felt quite uh, compelled to write about her. Um, 
so really that's where that came from uh, and then I have another thriller the other thriller unraveling um, is quite different again however I am now working on uh, another police procedural um, featuring a character from in the sh or not from in the shadow of the hill sorry from madness lies um, to start a new series and we'll probably incorporate quite a few characters from in the shadow of the hill uh, and madness lies but I quite like both types of fiction I like reading both types I love police procedurals but I also love psychological thrillers so um, I could see me continuing to write both if possible, maybe alternating between police procedural and, and, a, and a thriller. So I like, um, I did like the characters in yours. They were really well fleshed mm -hmm. out in, like, in the shadow of the hill. Um, and obviously that's why you've drawn in. And what I want to pick up before we talk about those is that you said you've never planned to write crime. Mm. What were you wanting to write? Uh, I started off writing historical fiction and contemporary fiction. I actually wrote a, a novel that was set half in uh, the first half was set in, um, in modern times and the second half in 18th century St Kilda. Um, and it was an enormous uh, novel. It took me years to write. And uh, I really thought that was the type of fiction I would always write because I was very interested in, um, you know, it was mostly based around the Highlands and Islands. And I was very interested in writing about that. Um, and I mean, over the years, as I say, the novel grew and grew, and eventually uh, a publisher asked me to send it to them. They quite liked the pitch that I'd sent. And it wasn't until then that I realised just how big it was. It took me days to print this thing out and uh, to send, I think I had to send it off to him in two parcels. Um, and I've never heard back from him, and I kind of like to think he's still reading it now because it was so long. Uh, but that was a good, good few years ago. Um, and, you know, I just, over the years, I only really came to write the short story that became the prologue of In the Shadow of the Hill because I joined a writing group in Fife and that was what they did was to write a short story every fortnight. I didn't really want to do that because I was so keen just on writing the novels. and uh, But I did it and they liked the story and you know someone commented that it would make a good uh, novel to find out what happened to the two little boys in the, in the story. So that's how it came to expand that story into a, a novel and I was there were two two young boys in the story and I was trying to think of what you know what might or what occupations they might have as they grew up and I just decided to make one of them a policeman so um, that's where it came from but you know I love reading crime and I watch a lot of crime drama so it probably wasn't really you know too much of a surprise to anyone that I would turn to crime eventually myself. Would you go back to the um historical fiction uh, I, I would like to I just don't have enough time really because uh, you know I've got to work as well as write and uh, you know I have I, I would love to go back to and and over the years I have gone back to that huge novel that I wrote and it's now two novels um, you know they, they're linked but they're not you know they're standalone um, and I have spent a lot of time over the years editing them and working on them I just haven't been able to get them published um, but you know if I did get them published that might be a spark to kind of try and uh, write a bit more but yeah I love, I love historical fiction too and I love historical crime fiction actually um, and you know I do wonder maybe the St Kilda part of it I may actually revisit that again and turn it into more historical crime rather than um, you know just historical fiction but uh, yeah never say never but there just isn't enough time that's the thing. I'm nodding in agreement because I love mm. historical crime fiction. I love historical fiction, actually. Mm. Yeah, I know, I do too, especially, you know, when it's well done, it's just wonderful. Um, do you have a particular period of history that you're really interested in? I like that that particular period of the 18th century in um, in St Kilda, just because it was a very interesting time in, the island, in that particular group of islands. Um, but I'm quite interested in much earlier as well. I, I quite... I, quite interested around the 11th century in Scotland uh, and that kind of period but I think it would take a huge amount of research obviously and um, but you know maybe one day you just never know. Fair enough got a few hellos uh, so Andrew said hello Sam has uh, T has said hello um, and there's a couple of questions Caroline on there said that um, I think it's Caroline Beam said that she wants you to write more of all of the things. All right. <laughs> so this is a that's a good start, isn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, T wants to know what your usual writing routine is. She's always in she writes books as well as TK Gearing. So all ah, right. Uh, at the moment, I'm trying to limit my work to three days a week. Um, so. 
I'll try and write um, in the morning on the days I'm not working and then maybe have a break early afternoon. Um, I've fairly recently got a dog, so she needs to be walked now. And uh, then I write again in the evening. On the days that I am working, I write every evening. And uh, at the weekends, again, it will be, back, you know, the writing in the morning uh, and then sort of taking the afternoon off to do other things and back to writing again in the evening. Um, during lockdown, I didn't have any work for three months, um, which was a bit of a concern financially, but uh, it just gave me loads of time to write. And I found that I could just write non-stop almost. Um, it was a bit manic and I think that was just a sign of the times and what we were going through and it was maybe a distraction but most of my book Unraveling was written um, during lockdown and I mean I was really pleased to find that I could sit for three months and write at almost every opportunity um, without feeling uh, you know without getting fed up of it really so you know if it would pay and I could give up the day job then I would write most of the time but I think the routine would always be writing in the morning and evening um, and, and having the afternoon off um, but even on work days sometimes I get breaks between um, between the type of work I do is hearings and I get breaks between hearings and I can sometimes sit down and do a little bit of writing then as well um, it depends what stage I'm at at the moment I'm I've started two new projects and I find the early stages quite difficult. It doesn't flow as well. And I know that, you know, I need to get at least sort of 20,000 words in before it starts to, to really flow. So uh, I'm struggling a bit and I'm going between those two at the moment, but still trying to do it every evening and on the days that I'm not working. So um, I'm also intrigued about the mental asylum that you talked about. Mm -hmm. I think, is that a real place? Yes, uh, it's it was called Craig Denane, um in it's when it was was most recently open. It closed finally in two thousand, um, and it's set on a hill in the outskirts of Inverness. It's quite an atmospheric building. But when it was first opened in eighteen something or other, it was called the Northern Counties District Lunatic Asylum. In those days, you know, well, I suppose most of these places were probably just called openly called lunatic asylums. Uh, and eventually it became Craig Deneen. And uh, yeah, I actually had a patern paternal great uncle who was there and uh, he had um, had a marriage breakdown and never really recovered. Although I have to say my memories of him, he was always just seemed as if there was nothing wrong with him at all. And I suspect he just became in institutionalised and enjoyed living there. He was certainly always wanted to get back quickly if he came to our house. But we used to go and visit him on a Sunday afternoon, um, which was like the you know funny thing for kids to do. But that was our Sunday afternoon outing was to go up to the Craig Denane and visit this great uncle. And uh, so that probably planted a seed in my mind about the place. Um, you know, it was all you never went there without there being a little bit of excitement from another patient or something, you know, that uh, to kids it was all quite exciting. So um, I kind of I, I knew a bit about it anyway. And uh, that was probably partly why I wrote about it. Um, but the, the real impetus for the book came from going on a visit to the local archive centre where they keep the records. Uh, and the records are, are quite funny uh, now, if you read them, the kind of things that people were incarcerated for, like you know, financial embarrassment, disappointment in marriage, uh, you know, things like that. And uh, so we, we were there for work one day and I was reading the records and I just kind of felt a story coming on, uh, although I decided not to set it as far back as the, the period that um, I use in the book, which is just the 80s, 80s and 90s. Um, but, you know, again, that might be a, another idea for the future would be something set further back using the records because the records are fascinating, you know, for the, for the place. So it's still there now. It's been transformed into um, luxury flats and townhouses. Um, it got, there was a fire in 2007 that destroyed some of it, but they've managed to preserve quite a bit of it. So it's still there. Um, so yeah, it's quite an interesting building. I don't know how I'd feel about living in a building like that though. I know I wouldn't fancy it myself. It's got fantastic views, but I mean, it's one of the things I say in the book in Unraveling is that I think you could, you know, the main character's mother um, died while she was a patient there and uh, she goes up to, to look at it and uh, she you know I have her saying that she probably could count on one hand the number of locals that would actually want to live there so that could be entirely wrong but I suspect that it's not local people really that have bought these flats the flats are lovely as with you know everything nowadays you can go on the internet and do you know look look around them a sort of video tour of the the flats that are for sale and they're absolutely beautiful and have fantastic views but I really don't think 
you know, that too many locals would fancy living there. And uh, I certainly would. I wouldn't mind the area because it's a nice area beside the forest, um, but I really wouldn't fancy it, I don't think. No, too, too. And the, there's too many, too many reasons why people got put in there that weren't for good reasons, isn't ah, it? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sam says, is there a period of time that you wish you'd lived through? Gosh, um, hmm. well, I suppose I've, I've, I've already said that I was very interested in 18th century St Kilda and I would have loved to have lived through that time um, and again, the 11th century uh, in Scotland. But, you know, a part of me thinks, you know, it's easy to romanticise about these times, isn't it? And I think that probably they're quite hideous times to live through. Um, but probably if I had to choose one, I think it would be uh, it would be 18th century uh, in Scotland. Just generally, uh, it was a time of great change. Uh, and I think I, I, I would have liked to. And certainly if, uh, from a writing point of view, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just go and observe it, you know, uh, as it was then and, and uh, see exactly what it was like. Um, so, yeah, I think that would probably be the period that I would choose. Yeah, I would think you want to do it like a bit H.G. Wells time machine-y. You know, where yeah. you can go and visit, or Bill and Ted. Um, you know, you can just go and visit and have a look around and then leave. Yeah, it'd be wonderful, especially if you, well, I quite like to be invisible as well, you know, to go and visit, but just to, for nobody to see me, but just have a look around and, uh, yeah, yeah love that. You, you're not stuck there, so you don't have to put up with, like, the horrible, like, kind of dirtiness and, like, lack of medical attention. and. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, i have been quite interested in prehistoric times as well. There's quite a lot of um uh, you know, rem prehistoric remains around here and around the islands and in Orkney. And certainly when I visit those, you know, I think it'd be fascinating to have, uh, not so much to have lived then, but again, like you say, to be able to travel to that then and see exactly how they lived in some of these wonderful, you know, wheelhouses and, and brochs and all these wonderful structures that they, they lived in. Uh, yeah, fascinating. He wants to know if you ever, oh, this is a really good question, T. Do you ever take on a character's persona? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I, I have been asked before if I think that I'm like any, you know, which character I'm most like. And I always just end up saying Detective Sergeant Joe Galbraith because he's a bit of an introvert um, and a bit of a perfectionist. Um, doesn't always suffer fools gladly, I suppose. But um, no, I don't think I, I don't think I do take on kind of perspective personas no um i have found the, the there's sort of two main characters in unraveling there's the the daughter um who's trying to find out the reason that her mother died uh, while she was in this hospital and in this middle of the book this part two is set in the 80s and 90s when her mother was in the hospital and writing that book was quite difficult uh i mean it, it wasn't difficult in that it flowed well and that was what i was doing during lockdown and i enjoyed writing it but it brought up a lot of memories of my own from the 80s and 90s of growing up in Inverness. And um, I do find now when I'm out and about, sometimes I'll pass a bar or somewhere that used to be a particular disco or um, bar or even passing creative in the hospital. And I have a pang for um, the character, Ellen, as if, you know, I knew her as if, you know, because I, I mean, it's, I'm not giving anything away to say that she, you know, she dies. It's, it's obvious that she dies. And killing her off was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. I felt really broke my heart doing that. Um, but I often feel when I'm wandering around the town or I'm, I'm down by the riverside, I, I just feel as if, you know, I, I'm almost mourning the loss of her still as if she was a real person. So, um, but uh, I don't think I've taken on any of the characteristics of, of any of the characters myself, no. Well, that's a good question, though, right? It is. Yeah, it really made me think, yeah. yeah. Can you tell us anything about the two projects you've got on the go at the moment? Okay. Oh, um, well, yeah, I've actually, I was going to say I've actually got three when I come to think about it, but I've completed um, Queen of Grime, which is a... Uh, um, it's a psychological thriller again set in Edinburgh and features a crime and trauma scene cleaner as the main character and so I say completed but if I if you know if a book hasn't gone to the publisher or the printer then I will just keep tinkering and tinkering at it so it could still change a little bit but it is more or less completed um, and then I started book two in the series of that um, because I was really keen to keep that going in a series and I'm struggling quite a bit just uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about eight or nine thousand words in, and uh, I just was finding it quite hard to get going. Um, 
I'm not very good at plotting, so or planning, I should say, or plotting. Uh, I just tend to do it as I go along. So um, I always, uh, with a new book, hit a stage where I feel I don't really know where I'm going, but I, I stop and I try and plot, and then I think, no, I've just got to write and get there. So I was at that stage with um, the second one in the Queen of Grime series, which doesn't have it, that second one doesn't have a name yet. And uh, in fact, I'm quite interested to tell this story and be quite interested to see what people think. Uh, I decided my last two books were independently published, but I'm finding it's quite hard work. It's hard work marketing and what have you. So I decided that with Queen of Grime, I was not going to go to the same efforts I'd gone to in the past to try and get a, a, either an agent or a publisher. But I thought I would just try a few, just a handful. Um, and I had quite a lot of interest in it. I've had three agents ask for the full manuscript and I've had... Then a couple of weeks ago, I sent it to um, a fairly big publisher and uh, within a week they came back to me, uh, having read the whole thing, which was unusual. And uh, the feedback was fantastic. She said she loved the writing. She loved the way I can do quite dark writing. Um, she loved the relationships between the characters, but they wouldn't be taking it on because she felt they could not... Um, they couldn't market or attract a big enough audience for a protagonist who was a crime and trauma scene cleaner. Um, she said if she had been a detective, it would be different, or if it was just an ordinary woman, it would be different, but she didn't feel that the main character being a, a crime scene cleaner um, would be enough of a selling point. So um, she's asked me to you know, let her know what else I'm working on and keep in touch, and she would be very interested in any other projects. So my question, I suppose, for anyone who's into, who feels like putting up an answer is, would you know? do you agree? Do you think that crime and trauma scene cleaner is not a good idea for a protagonist? I thought it was a great idea. I thought it was something different. Um, I can understand why people might not like, you know, the griminess of it and the maggots. And, you know, I, I've had to do a lot of research and I've had watched a lot of videos of um, these kind of death scenes which are very horrible you know I try not to dwell on it too much in the book and I try and make quite a bit of dark humour um but I find it quite a fascinating subject and then there was a BBC drama recently The Cleaner with just it was on a Friday night just um I think it was six half hour drama eight half hour comedies and I thought that was great uh, and I really thought the time might be right for you know a protagonist who was a crime scene cleaner um, so I was really disappointed. I was delighted with the feedback, really delighted with it, and but disappointed. And again, because I was struggling with book two, that threw me a bit. And so I then started on this more recent uh, police procedure, which I've been thinking about anyway. Um, there, there's a female detective in Madness Lies, and uh, I thought I might start a police uh, a series with her and also carry on Joe Galbraith's story but in a, in a new series so that's what I'm working on at the moment but I just uh, you know I'm going back and forth a little bit between book two of the the trauma scene cleaner and the uh, the new police procedural um which I quite like I quite like to have two different things on the go well I would read the trauma scene cleaner one mm. and um certainly someone else on here I'm just trying to put my phone on to see who's commented has said that they would read it as well. All right. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, I'm just I'm looking as well and seeing somebody saying uh, something about you mentioned St. Kilda. I've heard of it years ago. Is that a book event? Let's listen to it. Michael Faber. Oh, yeah, Michael Faber. Michel, Michel, Michel Faber, is that what you call him? Um, yeah, I don't think he's a crime writer, but he's a kind of um, quite an unusual literary, literary writer, isn't he? Um, it was Carol Carolyn Bean. She said she would definitely read it. It sounds fascinating. All right, right. Yeah, I thought there were loads of different stories could come from it. The, the first one that I've written, Queen of Grime, is um, really about the main character's family and some, a, a lie that she told ten years ago that comes back to kind of haunt her and her family, rather than it being based on any of the particular crime scenes. But there's certainly scope for um, stories to, you know, for stories to arise from crime scenes uh, and, and what have you. So uh, I think that would be interesting. Um, but no, it's good to hear that some people would read it anyway. Uh, I, I think that particular publisher, to be honest, is very commercial. And, um, you know, they do churn out a lot of books. Um, I think they are a great publisher, but I think, you know, maybe it's just a little bit too, um, it just not, not quite the, the kind of usual thrillers that they, they go for, so. Uh, Andrew was asking if there's a museum at St Kilda. Oh, was that Andrew, right? Because I can just see Facebook user. I can't see the names. Um, oh, yeah, see Andrew at the end. Um, there is, I think, one of the, there's a row of um, thatched houses that were built, uh, or, or black houses, and I think one of them has been turned into a museum. 
uh, St Kilda it is a fascinating place I've been out once uh, on a went in a boat and stayed there for two three nights uh, and it's a wonderful wonderful place and it was fantastic to visit there you know while I was writing the book because um, I really enjoyed you know just trying to envisage um, exactly how things looked and what you could see from where and make sure that I had everything you know correct logistically so yeah it's a fascinating place it's amazing yeah well we run that um one of the things that drew me in and in shadow of the hill was there's quite a lot of like sort of references to sort of the scottish history mm. and like folk tales and things like that is that a thing that you try and bring in quite a lot i think it is and that's really why i got interested in um writing in the first place was um I was brought up in Inverness, which is the capital of the Highlands, and my parents are both, or were both Gaelic speakers. Uh, my mum's from the Western Isles. But at growing up and while I lived here, I didn't really have a great interest in it. I suppose you always, you know, when you're young, you, you, you don't really value where you come from or your cultural history. Uh, and it was only when I moved away um, from Edinburgh, from Inverness to Edinburgh, that I suddenly started to become quite interested in Scottish history and uh, culture. And then I went to university after two or three years to study law and as an outside subject I did something called Scottish ethnology which uh, to me was wonderful after studying law all day I would go for my Scottish ethnology lecture and it would be about culture and history and oh, anything it could be about you know immigrants to Scotland about uh, various farming and crofting and folklore and what have you so I was really you know that that really is partly what got me into writing because I'd become very interested in all that and I needed a bit something to switch off from um, studying law so in the evenings I, I would write and so that's where I started really was with Scottish culture and history so uh, you know it's no surprise that it would it would find its way into the the crime writing as well eventually um, probably not as much as I would like actually it may, may do more of that in the future um, was, yeah I'm very interested in that sort of thing yeah. do you speak Gaelic? When I was living in Edinburgh, I, again, as an outside subject in, in university, in first and second year, I did did Gaelic. And then the thir in third year, it didn't, the times didn't tie in with my law. So that's when I did Scottish ethnology, actually, it was in third year. Um, so I learned a lot of Gaelic uh, while I was down in Edinburgh. I've never become fluent, but I can understand a lot. And then I went on to work in the Western Isles, and it was really helpful to have, uh, you know, to understand Gaelic. But the, the, biggest advantage of it was that my parents never spoke Gaelic to us they just used it to talk about us if they wanted us not to know what they were saying and eventually it got to a stage where they couldn't do that with me anymore because I could understand you know almost everything they were saying so uh, I wouldn't be very good at following a political news program or something like that but every day uh, you know every day conversation I'm, I, I'm not great at speaking it but I can certainly follow follow most of it yeah so. You've got so many questions, I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> I want to know if there's a part of writing you enjoy more than the rest. Oh, I, I, it's difficult. I actually enjoy editing. I know a lot of people don't like editing, but um, I quite like it. Um, I could spend ages going over and over bits and, and rewriting bits and what have you. Um, but I think I probably like the sort of second half of a, of a writing project because I said I find it quite hard to get to get into it initially um, but I love that stage when you just know exactly where you're going and uh, the writing is flowing and you know uh, it's it's usually happens you know I think I said earlier 20,000 words but probably 40 50,000 words once I know exactly you know where I'm going and uh, you know I tend to just get a little um you know light bulb moments as I go along where I think it could be in the middle of the night could be out for a walk whatever yes that's what's happening and uh, you know when I come back and start trying to write that I, I really enjoy that just feeling that I'm really progressing um, I get I don't think I get writer's block as such but I think I, I struggle a bit with um, just knowing where I'm going and I do wish that I could plot and uh, you know I hear of people who do chapter by chapter you know who have a complete chapter out of a outline of every chapter before they even start and I just think you know it must be great to be able to do that and uh, uh, but I just can't it just doesn't work for me I've tried it and I've spent ages trying it and I just can't so um, so yeah I think probably second half of, of any project is probably my favorite part just uh, when I know exactly what I'm doing and uh, T wants to know if you research as you go or you do all the research first 
I do it as I go. Um, it's funny because I've read, you know, big authors, Ian Rankin, people like that saying they don't do any research until the end, that they'll do the first draft and they'll make a note saying research this. But I suspect partly with me, it's it's a little bit of, um, it, you know, distraction sometimes. Just I'll be writing and I'll suddenly think, oh, I'll have to go and I'll have to go and look at that. So, uh, you know, I'll come off the come out of the Word document and go and look online for it. I mean, it's just amazing because everything is online nowadays. When I first started writing, I used to spend every Saturday afternoon in the, the library uh, in Stornoway with a list of things that I needed to research and, you know, books and books. I loved that research, but, you know, I would never be doing that now because everything's just there at the click of a click of a switch. So um, so I tend to do it as I go along and uh, I find that easier. Um, I, I may be wrong. Uh, I read uh, a really interesting book by Rachel McLean just last week. Um, I think it's Five Steps to Becoming a Successful Author, something like that. It was very, very good. And I've learned a few tips from it. Um, and uh, I think what she says is, uh, or, or maybe someone she quotes, is kind of to leave the research till, till later as well. Um, no, I think she said that she, she writes as she goes along and she edits as she goes along. But some people um, will just not do the editing and not do the research to write at the end and then go back. But I don't think that would work for me. I think I need to research as I go along, really, um, because it informs what you write. And I don't see any point in wasting time writing something and then researching and finding that I've got it wrong and having to go back. You know? We're going to stick with the research bit because Sam mm -hmm. says she's always fascinated by research too. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to know if anything was difficult to find an answer to when you were writing your historical things. Uh, I suppose the, the, ma the main thing was um, part of my um, St Kilda book uh, involves, I, I, I don't know if anyone will have heard of this, but there was a, a judge in Edinburgh, uh, early 17. 1727 or 29 or so called Lord Grange. Um, he was a judge and then he was um, became a member of parliament. And he, uh, his wife, Lady Grange, uh, did something to embarrass him and he decided to have her um, abducted and uh, sent to St Kilda, which well, was sent to another group of islands first for two years and then she was on St Kilda for seven years. So part of my story is about, you know, how well, she, she never fitted in there. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, but just this idea of this lady Grange from Edinburgh being transported to a place like that, uh, you know, uh, and, and just being thrown left there, really. Um, but what was difficult to research about that is it's there is no real consensus about why she why he did this um, because you know he could have had her committed to an asylum if he just thought she was uh, insane he could have done all sorts of things but he removed her to, to St Kilda um, but his brother was uh, the Earl of Mar who led a Jacobite uprising so part of the um, you know the, the history is that he that Lord Grange may have been a secret Jacobite as well and that his wife threatened to expose him so I've read so much around that um, but there just is no consensus really about why so in some ways it's good because it means you can you know it, it doesn't constrict you when you're writing because I like to kind of keep the facts fairly fairly true to life um, but with that one you know all I could do was hint that you know or have her uh, you know, say that uh, she suspected he was a Jacobite, but nobody really knows for sure exactly why uh, why he went to these lengths. And, and I mean, she in the end, she had two or three funerals. I mean, he, he pretended she had died. He um, removed, you know, she, she had about nine children who thought she had died. And, uh, you know, the whole thing sounds very tragic. And I just cannot imagine what it was like for her to, to land in a place like St Kilda. Um, because there isn't any, you know, I think life there was so extraordinary and so harsh but probably very, um, I think it's probably a very safe and, uh, um, you know, very tight knit community. Um, but I, I, I suspect that she was always on the outskirts and never wanted to be a part of the community. Um, so researching her was absolutely fascinating. The other, the, the fantastic thing was that I was in university at the time in Edinburgh. So I was able to get original sources and, uh, you know, people who'd done PhDs on, on St Kilda and things, and I was able to access them in the library. And that was fantastic just to be able to do that. And I, you know, I still have even now um, my notes that I've taken from some of the original sources are in pencil because you weren't allowed a pen in. And they're starting to fade. So I'm thinking one day soon I should go over them because I'm going to lose them because they're all starting to fade now. Um, but, I, you know, it was fascinating to do that. But yeah, that was one particularly... Um, difficult and very interesting part of, of research. What's the most interesting research rabbit hole you've been down? 
Mm. Oh, so research rabbit hole. You asked this question once before and I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> One of my favourite questions, just because I love going down them myself. Gosh, I, I can't think of a particular one. I mean, certainly been down many, many rabbit holes. Um, mm, I think possibly I, I, I may even if I may be repeating myself, I might have said this at last time. I, th I think I've said that, that uh, I find police procedure quite a difficult uh, rabbit hole. And I've gone down many, many uh, different rabbit holes there and found myself stuck and with deception, which involves uh, police although it's not a police procedure, uh, I decided to take some advice from Graham Bartlett's, um, you know, advisors. And uh, that was just fantastic. I would recommend that to anyone. It was uh, very reasonably priced. And uh, had I not done that, you know, I certainly would have been making quite a few mistakes uh, in the book with various stuff. Um, you know, just things you don't even think of. You see things on telly and think that's how it is and uh, then find it's not. Um, but yeah, I, su I suspect, I can't think of any any particular ones um, for, for the, the uh, police procedure, but there certainly have been, been many. Um, where I've, I've thought that you know this would this would work and that sounds great and then the trouble is you know you take advice and then find that you have to rewrite massive scenes because I did have to do that with deception once I'd spoken to the police advisor I just found that I had uh, you know quite quite a bit to to rewrite uh, there but you know I don't mind it's better than than someone getting in touch afterwards to say that you've done something wrong um, but yeah I'm going to think about that question because I'm sure there's a better <laughs> <laughs> I should have remembered that you asked you're likely to ask that question. Graham's a good one, so mm -hmm. that is great. I'm gonna ask you a quick fire round of um UK CBC favourite questions. Oh after, no. After, <laughs> after I've asked you T's question, which is does the weather affect how you write? Does the weather affect how I write? Mm. Um I don't think so. Um we're quite prone to uh, weather up here to um uh, you know, to storms and rain. And uh, so I think I'm quite used to it. I spend a lot of time in the Western Isles and I write a lot when I'm there. And again, the weather there can be horrendous uh, with storms. So I think the only effect it has is that I can write more because I'm less likely to be outside. Um, I mean, it's, it's a great question because, you know, it may be that one tends to write more dark stuff when the weather's dark and gloomy, but it's quite often dark and gloomy here. And I do write dark and gloomy stuff, so maybe there's a correlation. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't notice any any effect. I, I think, I, you know, I lived in the Western Isles for years, and the thing that most people who move there notice is the weather. And yet, I didn't really notice the weather. I it, I loved it so much, I think, for the first few years that, uh, you know, nothing could really put me off. And I, I never noticed, uh, you know, the weather was bad. I just went out and about and did my stuff and wrote when I wasn't out and about. And um, so I don't think I'm terribly affected uh, by it, I don't think. OK, you ready for the UK CBC favourite questions? Well, I told you before, I can clam up easily when I, if I don't, can't think of an answer. So <laughs> I'll try. You'll be fine. Have you ever acted out a scene while you were writing? No, um, I have, you know, logistically, um, maybe um, often I have to stop and maybe stand up and think about how if someone's holding someone a particular way or if, you know, somebody walks towards something, how they might do it. But no, I've never acted out a scene, just uh, thinking, just sometimes check that the logistics are right. Can you tell us about the most recent scene that you wrote without giving away a spoiler? Um, oh, that's difficult. I am writing about a character in the new police procedural who is a difficult person. I won't say what, what she does, but uh, I, the, the most recent research I've carried out and the most bit, recent scene I've written is about her exploring she's an no she's not elderly to say that she's younger than i am but she's an older woman and uh, exploring internet dating so um i uh, in fact that sort of ties in with your last question because i did have to uh, join a internet data a dating thing just to find out how you know just i wanted to know what kind of questions they ask and stuff like that so a couple of nights ago i signed up without putting up a photo or anything and uh, gave a false name <laughs> and uh, signed up for this internet dating it was fascinating absolutely fascinating and then i got some fantastic uh, fodder for the book if you like because some of the questions they asked were just 
absolutely ridiculous. So that was the last scene I was writing was really her reaction to being asked these questions and her answers, um, you know, and her being told, as I was when I put in what I thought her answers would be, you know, that your preferences are far too strict. You're not going to really meet many matches because, you know, because of the character she is, I pretended I was her. So, yes, that's funny because I did sort of act act, act as as her for that purpose, but I'd forgotten that. Um, so that's the last scene I was writing um, was, um, you know, it, it, it's all going to come to no good, obviously, uh, in a police procedural that... Uh, uh, you know, when, when something awful happens, awful happens to this woman in the first place, they're probably going to look us at the internet daters. But uh, yeah, that's the last thing I was writing. I love that answer. And now I'm intrigued <laughs> about what kind of things they are. I've never internet dated. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was really funny. No, this 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 particular um, site was just, um, you know, the questions that we're being asked, you know, uh, but obviously it was probably some psychometric kind of you know, personality test or something. It's probably maybe quite common. I've heard of employers and people using a psychometric testing, but I've never, I don't think I've ever done one. So, um, no, it was quite, it's quite funny. And I love to imagine her reaction to these questions as well. So, yeah, quite enjoyed that. I had to do one at, at work. All right. Uh, um, put you, gave you a colour. All right. And I hated it. I was like, I don't want to do this because no one else will be the same one as me. I'll be like the weird one. Uh -huh. And it'll all be odd and uncomfortable. And I was one of three people. Oh, right. That got the colour that I got. And everybody else was something else. And I was like, this is what I predicted. <laughs> Even <laughs> <laughs> It sounds strange. I don't think I'd like that kind of thing at all. <laughs> no. I didn't like it. Um, the other um, favourite questions, what are your most memorable moments as an author? Um, probably the first book launch for In the Shadow of the Hill. I had um, never met the publisher. Um, funnily enough, the publisher was based in the Western Isles where I had lived previously, but I had moved away to Inverness and uh, I'd never met them. And on the day of the launch, I arranged to meet uh, the publisher for lunch. And I met him and I said to him what I've just said to you, um, tonight when we do the launch, don't uh, ask me any questions that we haven't practiced because I'll just clam up and I won't be able to answer anything. And he was a bit worried. He said, you know, just be like a politician. And if you don't like the question, answer a different one. And I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. I'm going to be terrified. Uh, I can't possibly do that. So stick to the script because they had sent me questions in advance. So that was fine. So I went along to the book launch and uh, I went into Waterstones in Inverness and there was nobody there. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic. There's nobody there. That's great. And then I looked up and they had a gap. There's a sort of mezzanine floor and it was absolutely packed with people. And I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And my family had sent flowers and there were all these people there and what have you and uh, I sat down and he asked the first question and I just relaxed completely into it and I had the most wonderful time and I absolutely loved it I, I thought it was just great and I did a reading and answered all the questions and, and he did stick to the questions and at the end of it he came up to me and he said I can't believe you're the same person I met for lunch have you been drinking <laughs> and I was like no I hadn't touched any drink I thought I'd keep my quota of drink for afterwards instead of um you know, drinking before I went along to the book launch. Uh, but I think that was probably my most memorable thing because I had been so scared and it, there's this imposter syndrome thing where you think, who am I to think that, you know, A, I can write a book, B, get it published and then, you know, go into Waterstones and, uh, you know, read from it and answer questions as if I'm a real author, you know, and just for, you know, to find that I just relaxed into all so much and uh, absolutely loved it and, um he was just gobsmacked. This guy he said, I, "I just can't believe that you, you just not like you're not the same person I met." Because I was so terrified. Um, so that's probably you know one of my most positive um, memories. I think you're doing a marvelous job tonight because I didn't <laughs> tell you any questions beforehand. No, you didn't. I'm sure you, someone's going to catch me out before long. <laughs> no one's going to catch you out. See, you do. There's not that long left, and you're doing fantastic. <laughs> Well, one thing, I do, yeah, I've got a friend who's a writer and um, she got published after me and uh, 
she was very nervous the very first time we were doing something, you know, and I had to say to her that, although I do get very nervous, um, you know, remember nobody knows more about your books than you do. So uh, she's always found that really helpful since then. She just suddenly realized that people weren't going to catch her out. Well, certainly not with questions about her books because, uh, you know, she was the expert on them. So, but it's the other questions that, that might catch me out. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my favorite author chat question is, would you make a graphic novel of your book? Yeah, I knew that you'd asked this one before and I was having a think about it. I, I don't know that any of my books lend themselves to it. I, I must say I'm not terribly familiar with graphic novels. Um, I have two grandchildren who are now 11 and they're very into their graphic novels. And uh, you know, so I occasionally pick them up and have a look. But I can't imagine that mine would lend themselves to that. I could be wrong. Um, I say I've never really looked at any adult graphic, no graphic novels. So... Uh, I'm not sure about that one. Um, I was thinking about that today, actually. And I was running through my books thinking, <laughs> can't see it really with any of them, but, you know, I don't know. There's a great range of crime and a lot of um, quite famous crime writers that write. Oh, do they? For long-running graphic novel series, yeah. Oh, Ian right. Rankin and Denise Mina have written for Hellblazer. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that actually. That's interesting. Gosh. Oh well, you never know. I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I should have a look at what's out there actually. I should, I should have a look. Some really good crime ones. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, uh, other questions. Andrew wants to know if your books are available in audio and large print. Oh, no, uh, they're not actually. Um, Partly because, well, the first two, who knows what my publishers think, why they haven't done that, I don't know. Um, but my own ones the, that I've independently published, I just simply at this stage couldn't afford um, audio books. I would like to, it's certainly something I would like to um, in, in due course, because I've just not long started um, listening to audio books myself, and I'm really enjoying that. Um, although I do find it's quite interesting because, it, you know, the um, experience is completely different. I listened to... Two of Ross Greenwood's, his first two books, is it The Snow Killer and The Soul Killer? No, I can't remember which is which. Uh, yeah, Soul Killer and then The Snow Killer. I listened to them on audiobook and then I've just recently read The Ice Killer and it was a completely different experience. And I, you know, realised just how much the, the narrator can affect your enjoyment of it. Um, I mean, I loved them all, but I think I much preferred reading them to listening to them. Um, whereas the other way around with other books, you know, I've listened to and read... Um, several other authors and, and preferred the audio so I like to have the choice um, so it's certainly something I would love to do but um, maybe not yet I mean people say oh you should do it yourself or you've got a nice voice or, you know you could do it but apparently it's very difficult to do and it's obviously you know leave it to the actors really to do that rather than yourself and um, as for large print somebody did mention to me recently another independent author that um, they've been doing that and had found there was quite a market for it so I think I'm going to look into that because um, I think that would be, be great to make them more accessible um, to people. And Sam has asked what you've learned with each book to make the next easier to write. Yeah, um, it's, it's difficult on that. I definitely have found each one easier to write, although I should say that the very first one in some ways was easiest because I didn't have the, um, you know, when I wrote the first book in the shadow of the hill, I wasn't thinking about getting published. I was just enjoying the, the writing it and it took me you know, a few years to write because I was just tinkering and writing a little bit at a time. Um, so that's probably, you know, I probably enjoyed that one the best because there was no um, pressure. I wasn't thinking I've got to get this series underway or I've got to write this and I've got to get it published. So um, probably really just the craft of writing. I think they just, um, you know, I don't, I, I'm not very good at putting it into words, but I think that each each book that's come out is better written. Um, you know, there's no doubt about that. I feel it myself when I read them and I felt that others have, you know, and I know that others have said the same thing. Um, and that's certainly, I suppose, how you want it to be. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what it is. I think it is just, as I say, practice. Um, if I look back at my first two books now, in fact, I read them recently with a view to um, starting this new police procedural. Um, and I realized that quite often I don't make things terribly clear. Um, or I think they're clear because I know they're clear. They're clear to me. Um, so when I read them back and I see, I think, oh, gosh, I should have put in, you know, so-and-so said there rather than, you know, having a bit of dialogue that's not necessarily clear who it came from or, um, you know, just 
not explaining a situation clearly. So I think that I, I, I doubt I would find that so much in my more recent books because I think I've learned um, to look at it from the reader's point of view as I'm writing and or as I'm editing, really, um, to look at it and think, right, you know, I know what's going on there and I know exactly what's happening, but, you know, will the reader? So I've learned to do that just to, I think, you know, at first I was writing just, you know, as a writer, writing almost almost for myself. Um, and then, you know, as it's gone on, uh, I've, ha I've had to take a step back once it's written and, uh, you know, really look and, and make sure that it can be understood. And it's helpful now, of course, to have a... a uh, editor to help me with that as well because I send my books away to a professional editor and you know she can point out these sort of things as well but uh, you know I like to think as time goes on she would probably point out less in that kind of way because I think you do get uh, you know you, you definitely learn from each one as you go along um, so that the, the whole process is a bit easier next time and hopefully the the end product is better as well. Good answer. So We've talked about the characters being really important in your books and being character led. But the locations are a sort of a real standout as well, I think, for you. Yeah. Do you share pictures of the locations? Um, I haven't too much yet. Uh, when Deception was coming out, uh, just to really fill a space on my website and to announce that it was coming, I put up a few pictures from the book of scenes in the book. But I think what I really need to do is, um, you know, have a dedicated space on my website where I, uh, you know, have bits from each book saying this is where such and such happened and, and what have you. Because, I mean, I have loads of pictures from each book. You know, I did do so much research. I really am um, quite a, you know, I love... Uh, right. I love writing that's set in places that I know and that I can visualise. And so I find I do feel the setting is a huge, is, is a hugely important part of it. And I think it would be great to have that maybe on my website. It's just, you know, a page for each book um, of, of places and maybe little videos and things as well of, of um, you know, of the setting and, and the, the place, because I think it, it does seem to be something that people enjoy. Um, it's just you know, getting the time to, to do these things, but I really, I really should do it. I have just so many pictures. In fact, today I was going through a lot of my pictures um, from unraveling of the old um, asylum buildings and what have you, and thinking, you know, I really should have those up on the website. So I'm certainly going to try and do that, I think. Uh, Sam wants to know if reader feedback has influenced your book. Well, yes, it does uh, to some extent, but funnily enough, um, I've only just very recently had two um, blog tours carried out. So one for um, Deception, when it came out a month ago, I had a blog tour for that. And then within a few days, for some reason, when I booked them, I thought it was a good idea to have them almost back to back. I decided to get another one done for Unraveling. So um, I've had Deception and then Unraveling and um, the interesting thing is that, you know, I had something like, I don't know, maybe 30 reviewers for Deception. I think it was a 10 day blog, but it was two or three each day. And then maybe seven days with three a day for Unraveling. So 21 for Unraveling and maybe 30 or a bit, a, maybe a few less than 30, but uh, more than 25 for, for uh, Deception. And, uh, you know, I would say that probably 95% of the feedback was good, um, but, you know, that, I can, you can 95% of people saying that they loved it and it was wonderful, but it, that will not have nearly the same effect on me as the 5% that did not. So I'll be completely scarred and traumatized by a, one comment that someone might make that, uh, you know, something they didn't like about the book. Uh, and, and I think that's it's an interesting thing about our, our psyche, I suppose, is just that negative feedback uh, affects you far more than the positive, or me anyway, far more than the positive feedback. Um, so I'm trying to kind of rise above that and not be wounded by uh, somebody not liking something. But, um, you know, I did consider, you know, I think what I'll do is look back over them all and take out, you know, themes. If there are people, if, if several people are saying the same thing, then that would certainly affect, you know, in the future. If, if several people were saying that they didn't like a particular thing or that I wasn't, you know, they didn't like dialogue, my dialogue or something like that. I would certainly use that to, to um, you know, to, to make changes in the future, I think. I can't think that it's happened too much, to be honest, um, you know, because because nobody, you know, it's so subjective, isn't it? And, and some people like, you know, some people like your books and some people don't, and there's not an awful lot you can do about that. But I think it is wise to, um, it probably is wise not to read reviews at all, but at this stage, I'm still reading them. And uh, as I say, if there are particular themes that, you know, might inform my writing in the future, I would certainly try and, and look at them. But 
you know, when you get one reviewer one day on the same day saying, you know, this is wonderful, this book just, you know, flows, I couldn't put it down, I read it in one sitting, you know, it just, it, it was just wonderful. And then you get someone else is saying, uh, you know, it took me ages to get into this book and it really didn't flow. It's really, you think, who do I trust? And who do, you know, as I say, the, the, the negative one will make more of an impact upon me, but, uh, you know, how do you, it's just so subjective, isn't it? That's, you know, I don't want to be influenced too much by what people say. So I think if there's a common theme, then I would be, um, but yeah, just, you know, I think you, you could easily let yourself be swayed by what everyone says. And, and I read something recently about, you know, saying you just have to let go of the book once you've written it and that's it. You know, you have to send it out there. Don't read the reviews, just, uh, you know, let it go kind of thing. But I do try and get, you know, beta readers to read before I publish. So I certainly take into account what they say as well, um, you know, and, and, and at, at an earlier stage. So it's easier to yeah, amend things then before it's actually published. So. Do you have a, a last question? Because we're getting, we've got five minutes left. All right. Um, do you have a favourite character that you've created? Oh, um, let me just look at my books to think. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's quite a lot of them. I, I do, tend, I, I get quite into the characters and... Uh, I tend to like them. There's, yeah, I quite liked, um, I don't know if you'll remember Betty from In the Shadow of the Hill. Um, she was in, actually, she was in the New Craigs, which was the, um, a, you know, the, what came after Craig Denane, the old psychiatric hospital closed, then you had New Craigs. So, so she was the mother of Stephen in, in The Shadow of the Hill, and she appears again in, in Madness Lies. And I liked her because she was, she's obviously got some kind of, dementia or alzheimer's um but is quite lucid at times and knows exactly what's going on at times and I, I i like her and i really enjoyed writing her writing the bits from her because um i you know just i, I like a character with a bit of duality so you know sometimes she's absolutely fine and other times she's um she's she's just not there at all um so i, I like her very much and i quite like uh, in unraveling uh, the baddie jamie ogilvy <laughs> uh, i loved writing him and a uh, I wondered how people, what people would think about him, but they, um, they seem to, well, there's a mix. You know, some people hated him and didn't think I gave him a hard enough time at the end. He shouldn't, you know, he should have had a, you know, been hung, drawn and quartered kind of thing. And other people liked the, I, it's, what I was trying to do was say that, you know, that not all baddies are entirely bad. And in fact, I think with the baddie and in the shadow of the hill, I've got a bit of that as well. And more so in Madden's Lies, um, you know, that just most bad people you know nobody's all bad so um I, I quite Jamie Ogilvy I, I felt was not all bad uh even though he did awful things um so I, I quite enjoyed writing him and thought I wouldn't have minded meeting him at some stage just because I, I I did quite like him so but I tend to yeah I, I like I really enjoy the character and development of you know developing the characters um so you know I, I, hard hard to pick a favorite I think yeah fair enough um, and then we've got two minutes left. Do you want to finish us off with a reminder about yourself and your books? All right. Is that all the questions? Have I answered everything? That, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Hey, oh, gosh. What do I want to say? Um, yes, just, uh, you know, my two more recent ones, as you know, Deception and Unraveling, and they're both available um, on Kindle. And um, for anyone who's interested in um, paperback copies, they're available uh, well, more locally, they're in the local Waterstones and Highland bookshops. They're probably not any further uh, afield than that, but they're available. Signed copies are available from my website with free um, UK P and P, and with free bookmarks thrown in. I know everybody's really fond of bookmarks, so um, the free bookmarks come with those. Uh, and then the two earlier ones, police procedurals, are available really on Amazon, uh, and paperbacks for the the two later ones are available on Amazon too. And uh, fingers crossed that Queen of Grime will be out there before to well before the end of the year. I would hope, uh, depending on uh, publishing. If I, do, I say I'm not going to try any harder to get a publisher. So um, if nothing comes of the the you know the people that I've approached so far, then I'll be independently publishing that as well. Hopefully before the end of the year. So look out for that and prove them wrong that uh, you know a crime and trauma scene cleaner can be uh, an interesting protagonist and, and something that you'd like to read about. Sounds fascinating. Uh, we've been thanked for a wonderful interview. Oh, good. Thank you all for listening. It's great. Mm -hmm.
and thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for everything you do. It's just such a wonderful um, Facebook group. It's fantastic. And, uh, you know, I can't, I can't believe just how many different author interviews and, and great things you have going on. It's fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you.